Good morning. It is wonderful to see everybody this morning. I'm glad that you have chosen to worship with us uh, in person and also all of those who are online. We are uh, uh, slowly starting to recover. Uh, we have fewer people who are sick. Uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, I do pray, of course, for your continued health and that uh, we may continue to work our way out of this particular pandemic. We don't actually have a whole lot of announcements today, so you are welcome to uh, read what we do have on the back of your uh, uh, sheet there. I will say that I know that um, Kathy Corbett is headed out of town this week, so if you need to know anything about the church, wait till next week to call, because um, I have got no clue whatsoever. But uh, no, uh, uh, of course, we will try to help you out, but we do also have an encyclopedic knowledge in, uh, in Kathy. Let us prepare our hearts and minds now as we worship together. Let us pray. Holy God, as we lift our voices to you in praise, as we turn to you in prayer, as we hear your word read and proclaimed, may we open our hearts to know you as you are, rather than as we wish you to be. For who you truly are will be greater than any idea we may have of you. Help us to follow you and be your people on this earth. In your name we pray. Amen. So good to see you this morning. And if I may say so, it's good to be seen this morning. Uh, I couldn't say that this time last week. Uh, so good to be back. Uh, but that brings me to a, a time of uh, appreciation here. I want to thank Brenda, Charles Corbett, and Bob O'Connor for taking care of business for me last week. They do such a good job each and every time, and uh, I just really uh, appreciate so much there being a, this one was less preparation because I didn't know until Saturday that I had another day and a half to stay in. And uh, so it, it all got together very quickly and very proficiently. And thank you, Brenda, thank you, Charles, thank you, Bob. We're going to continue the theme set by the call to worship this morning, that of greatness and the might of God. Turn with me, please, to hymn number 77. O oh Lord my God, how great thou art. Hymn number 77. Let's stand together, please. I hear the roaring thunder. 
join with me as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed found on 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, as you are seated, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we approach the throne of grace in prayer. Gracious Father, you have given us not just our salvation, not just a better way to live in the world, not just the hope that transcends all hope. You've not only just given us the ability to continue on, you have also given us purpose. For we are here for a purpose. We have been given a mission to embody, to put flesh to, to be hands and feet, to be the sweat of a brow, to be the tear of an eye, to be the warmth of an embrace. You have sent us with purpose to go and make disciples. Each of us commissioned by you, anointed by you, and empowered by you are sent. Help us, Lord, to claim 
our purpose, to claim who we have been meant to be our entire lives, someone who continually points back to you and says, look at what he has done for me. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord through his prophet. And now on the first day of the week, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I do not throw open the gates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that cannot be counted. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we have indeed received so much. And we have attempted in whatever way we are able to return to you praise, thanksgiving, our efforts, our talents, and our resources. May we continue to see how you stand true to your promise that in giving we shall receive more than we can ever imagine. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior.
This morning's scripture comes from John 4, 27 through 30. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. The word of God for the people of God. So today we're wrapping up our series. Our series that is uh, really it's an evangelistic series and uh, I'm sure there, there may be one or two people who are happy that the, the pastor will get all this out of his system and then we can get on to other things. But I, uh, I want to let you know that this, this whole plus one thing, you're, it's not going away. Um, <laughs> you'll be reminded throughout the year. As a matter of fact, it's, it's something that, that I, I think needs to be one of the, the bedrock, bedrock core values of any church, honestly, that we make it very clear that when we join the church, our goal our uh, hope that each and every member will lead at least one person a step closer to Christ each year. Not 10, 15, not 1,000, just, just one. You're only responsible for one at a time. So... We will talk about our plus ones throughout the year. We're going we're gonna to talk about the idea that, that this actually carries on through all aspects of our faith. 
The idea that, that Jesus has done well for us is the thing that should send us forth so that Christ might do well for others. That others may come to know the power that Christ has delivered to us. We began uh, the series, I, I told you I had grown up surrounded by Christ's love in the form of his church. I, uh, the people were, were conduits of the love of God into my life, and I never knew what it was like to not have an entire community behind me. Nor did I want to know what it is like not to have an entire community behind me. It, it strikes a kind of fear into my heart, imagining the idea that I can turn around behind myself while I am and looking behind myself while I am falling and no one is there. That, that is a kind of fear that I do not want to know. And yet, it is a kind of fear that so many throughout this world experience day in and day out. That they are quite literally one mixed up decision away from rock bottom. that they don't have anyone there, even so much to come and mourn with them. This course is meant to help us, a bunch of mainline Christians, remember that there is a world out there, and that world loves to chew people up and spit them out left and right. And it is not here to help people. Christ, working in and through us, is here to help this world. Christ is, honestly, the only hope of this world. And if Christ is to be the hope of this world in a tangible way, then we too must take up our call to make it tangible. We learned that we have been called to love. Not just to tolerate and not just to go around uh, and, and ask people if they know Jesus Christ, but to show people the love that Christ has shown us. We admit the difficulty that some people are professionally unlovable people. <laughs> there are some folks out there who should get paid for just how difficult it is to love them. There are some people who have an uncanny ability to bury the spark of the divine image so deep within them that it is next to impossible to discover it. But if we trust in what God is telling us through his holy scriptures, then we know that every person, every person has been created in the image of God and contains the spark. Some it's easy to see and some it's not. So if you cannot love the person, love the divine that is within them. Love Jesus Christ, who is somewhere hidden inside. We learned about investing. Investing is, is important when we come about it from a, a, a place of, in our hearts. We know that our investment in another person does not necessarily mean that we are going to shelter them from the consequences of their every bad decision, but that we are willing to walk with them through the consequences of their bad decisions. That if they have gotten themselves into a difficult spot, it's not necessarily our call unless we do have the ability to shelter them from some kind of form of oppression or hatred or any other kind of situation. We haven't been called to be doormats or enablers. We have been called to be sisters and brothers who walk alongside. 
Job's friends came to him and did not say, here's enough money to get started. They sat down and they mourned. And they were the best friends ever for seven days. <laughs> then they opened their big mouths. Today, we're going to talk about inviting people into the life of faith. I mentioned in my first sermon that the, the number one thing I hear whenever I talk about uh, our reaching out, our evangelizing, our letting other people know about Jesus Christ is that, Joe, I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to do it. And what I'm hoping is that through this series, you've seen that your words are not even secondary, maybe tertiary or farther than your love and your concern and your empathy, simply the ability, honestly, to be a human being to another human being, to care, to be willing to mourn with those who mourn, celebrate with those who celebrate, and point out what God has done in your life. We don't have to be theologians or biblical scholars to invite people to be a part of this whole Jesus thing. Jesus will do the work on the person. We don't have to convince people that Jesus is real, even. We simply invite. Our scripture today comes from the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. You see, uh, Jesus <clears throat> is heading uh, back up north, I believe, from uh, Jerusalem, and uh, <clears throat> he decides to go through Samaria, and the, the Jews and the Samaritans are not the best of friends. Um, they, they have uh, not only some significant cultural differences, uh, but they also have uh, some religious differences. Now, the Samaritans would consider themselves Jewish, but the Jews would not consider them Jewish. So it's kind of like it's kind of like if the Jews were Methodists and the Samaritans were Baptists. We just don't want to intermingle. You know what I mean? Like we want to keep them somewhere else. But Jesus decides he's going to be busting, walking right through Baptist country, which is just dangerous in and of itself, because they don't want the Jews there either. And he goes to get some water, and the woman comes out, and he has this whole thing about living water, and she thinks it would be really great if I didn't have to walk out to this well every single stinking day and carry water back to the house. So, you know, she's like, give me that water. And uh, so Jesus is trying to lay down some pretty heavy hints that that's not really what he's talking about. And uh, he, he, he starts talking about uh, uh, the love that God has for all people and how God is transforming the world in front of her very eyes. And so, like any good Baptist, or Methodist for that matter, she, she responds to this beautiful response of this man pointing out a few things that he probably shouldn't know about her life, but nonetheless does. She says, I see you're a prophet, so let's start a doctrinal argument. Which is exactly what happened. She, she starts a theological argument because the Jews worship in, in Jerusalem on uh, uh, Mount Zion, but the Samaritans worship on another mountain because they believe that's the mountain that's, that's important. And uh, so, so she asked him, you know, the worship wars. Which one is right? Is it contemporary music or is it uh, uh, traditional worship? Or is it the Baptists? Or that she basically asked him what denomination she's supposed to be. And he's like, I, I don't think you're really getting this. So here's, here's the thing. Okay. There's going to come a time, and actually it's kind of already here, where it doesn't matter where you go to worship. What matters is where you worship from, in spirit and in truth. We will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, so it doesn't matter what land we stand on. 
It matters if we are worshiping with the whole of our spirits. So then she tries to bring back some more um, theological stuff because that's a comfortable place. And it's a comfortable place for us, too. Because there are supposed to be right and wrong answers to theology. And we love telling people when they don't get it right. We've, we've reduced evangelism to making sure people believe the right kind of doctrine before they enter the church. Making sure people understand that this, this is what we're going to do right here. And it, it, if, if you can fit in this box, then you can be part of our tribe. But if you don't, then you need to go be a part of another tribe. And uh, she, she asks him, she turns the conversation once again around here. He just opened up the beauty and the majesty and the power of God who is saying, the mountains don't matter, your heart matters. And then she says, I see, I see you're, you're obviously a learned man and I've heard this thing about the Messiah. He'll, he'll let us know what it's all about. And he says, woman, I'm, I'm, I'm he. This Jesus who told disciples and the people that he, he, uh, uh, he healed and those who saw his miracles, he told them, all of them, be quiet, don't tell a soul, right? You know, he was saying, don't go, don't tell anybody what you just saw. Just go and live your happy life. Just, you know, don't tell anybody that I did this. But to a Samaritan woman, he reveals himself. And he does point out, he points out that she's living a life, she's living a life she's not meant to live. Now, we often interpret that in the terms and understandings of, oh, she's just being flippantly promiscuous. She doesn't have one husband, she has five husbands. She's jumping from man to man, but what if what if instead of when Jesus pointing out how she's not living her life right, instead of saying this is what's wrong, he says, "Do you know that you are worth so much more than the love that you're getting from these people?" Do you know how precious you are? Do you know you're worth more than having to bounce from man to man to man? So she, she goes after this conversation. She goes and she, we hear in the scripture today come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Come and check him out. He can't. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Do you think he might be the one? Throughout the book of John, this idea of coming and seeing is, is an important thing. Go back a couple chapters. In, in verse, uh, uh, or cha chapter 1, verse 39, uh, a, a couple of people see uh, or hear Jesus teaching, and, and they ask him, where are you staying? We'd love to spend some more time and to hear some more teaching. And so Jesus just tells them, well, come and see. And then, and then later, <clears throat> later uh, one of Jesus' disciples goes to his brother and says, you've got to come and see this. This, I think he might be the thing, the real thing. I, he might be be the Messiah. And his brother responds, can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, that's like, that's like us walking up into Mountain Brook and saying, hey, we found Jesus, and believe it or not, he's from South Shelby. Can anything good come from South Shelby? But the disciple simply just says, come, come see. Come check this place out. You've got to see this guy. Let 
Verse 39 of our scripture today, if you continue reading, it says, Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of this woman's testimony. All she said was, come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He might just be the real thing. We're always so bogged down on what we're supposed to say and how we're supposed to get people into the church. When really all... All we want to do is to ask people to give Jesus a chance. Not the church, not the preacher, not the worship band, Jesus. Come, come and see if you can see Jesus through our group. If anything, if you have to say anything, simply talk about what this Jesus guy has done for you. Now, this, this sermon series, uh, I, I always do my, my sermon planning with uh, a long-term friend and, and colleague uh, in this conference. And we sit down and, and we'll work out series ideas to, um, together and uh, bounce ideas off of one another and help flesh them out. It, it keeps us from going insane because... We're not that creative, so we need one another to kind of come up with something. So, uh, but this series we worked a little more closely on, and honestly, I, I, I asked him, I said, I'm a little concerned that there are people in our churches who haven't actually had an experience with Jesus Christ. Not, not the Jesus Christ of Scripture. They, they hear about Jesus. They've learned about Jesus. They've, they've been in church, but truly experiencing the real Jesus Christ, the Word of God, in existence since the beginning of time, and enfleshing himself in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and continuing on at the right hand of the Father, that Jesus. Not the Jesus that the culture has, has uh, taken and uh, uh, used to anoint whatever particular thing they want to anoint, whether it be uh, uh, politics or um, uh, trying to sell you something or whatever, any other kind of thing there is out there. Not, not this culturalized Jesus, which is meant to uphold all of my uh, current ideology, my current understandings of the world, the, the way I think the world should work today. No, the Jesus who we hear about in Scripture, that Jesus. Admittedly, the modern American church has done poorly introducing people to the Christ who transcends all things. Because the Jesus of Scripture does not fit in to any of our understandings of this world well. He will challenge every understanding you have except for that of His. Because His is the only perfect one. This Jesus, this Jesus is the only one whose eyes can truly see the reality of this world around us. We listen to interpretations of the world and the events around us it, all the time. We listen to these interpretations. We go home, we turn on the news. That's an interpretation of events that occur in the world. We listen to uh, interpretations from our friends. We listen to interpretations from advertisers. We, we listen to everyone's particular view of the world around us. But as Christians... We have said that all of these are taking a distant, distant second seat at best behind the interpretation of Jesus, of the world around us, of the events around us. We've 
we've married ourselves to the culture, especially in the mainline church. We've kind of echoed its moving around, and we're still doing it. People keep saying the, the world is being affected by the culture, and they use it in specific terms. They never use the idea that the culture is dividing into smaller and smaller subgroups, and now so is the church. We parrot the ideology of the world around us rather than that of the Jesus of the Bible. We pick a piece out here because it, it helps us. We've, we failed as churches, as ministers, to, to preach holistic spiritual practice. I guarantee that in the modern American church you were taught one way to pray. Every other way you have probably had to find out on your own. But you were, you were taught intercessory prayer. That is, I'm going to bring all of my concerns to God. I'm going to lift them up to him and hope he does something with them. Did you know that there are more ways to pray in silence than there are in speaking? There are ways to pray with your body. There are ways to pray simply by trying to push out as much of the world around us as possible. There are ways to pray in which you suddenly enter the presence of God in such a way that you are overpowered and awakened to just how massive this God is and just how small we are. But that didn't fit into our understanding of faith in which we thought all we needed to do was transfer information and that would transform souls. So we see the church around us, so many churches around us, kind of taking this new information, looking at it and saying, it, we, need to, we need to do something. And we need to do something different because the church does look too much like the world. And that, that, my friends, is the critique that the people outside the church have of the church. It's not that we're different. It's that it's like it hasn't made any difference. The church inspires no greater level of giving than those who do not attend. The church inspires no greater love of life than those who do not attend. The church inspires no higher morality than those who do not attend. Because for so long, throughout uh, the, the 20th century, we believed that simply transferring information to you, me up here yapping at you, or sitting through Bible studies and Sunday school classes are going to actually transform us and that is not actually how Jesus did his work. And so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to promise you that I will continue learning and developing whatever skills it takes to help each and every one of us experience the Jesus Christ of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Jesus Christ that is revealed through Scripture, the only true Word of God. I promise you that that will be the Jesus I present to you. And I will help you develop whatever it is that you need so that you can come into that presence and experience him for yourself because nothing I say is ever going to live up to the experience of being immersed in the presence of God. You can't teach that. And then, with my promise to you, I ask you to take up this challenge, to go into this world, to say that I have experienced Jesus, 
not the Jesus who hurt you in that other church, because that wasn't the real Jesus. Not the Jesus you hear about from the yahoos on television, because that's also not the real Jesus. Not the Jesus that you hear about in so many other churches that sounds more like a political pundit than a word of God. Instead, I am going to invite you to come and see the presence of the Jesus who is a part of of the Holy Trinity of God. I promise I shall do all I can to bring us into that presence. I ask you to do all you can to bring others into that presence as well. And that takes no theological knowledge. That takes no scriptural understanding. That, that takes nothing more than being willing to tell someone to come and see. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we, we do love that you are unknowable no matter how much. We, we try to learn, no, no matter how much we even experience you, you're, you're not truly able to be grasped. You are so immense and amazing, and you have shown yourself in our lives repeatedly. Help us, Lord, to go from this place with a new heart for those around us, with a, a, a conviction that we will invest in the life that we will love and that we will invite one person into your presence each and every year we are on this earth. Help us to take up your mantle to go and to be your people. Help us to experience you as you are, purely, without filters, of the world. Help us, Lord, to take that message into the world today and to invite people to come and see. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm number 397, please. 397, let us stand.
Next week, we begin a new series called The Sacred Ordinary, where we are going to be talking about how each and every moment of our ordinary, everyday lives can indeed help us draw nearer to God. So if you're interested in how brushing your teeth might just help your uh, uh, spiritual life, come on next week and we're going to talk about it. And now receive this blessing upon your lives. May the power of Almighty God keep you safe from all harm. May the glory that is our risen Savior shine through you for all this world to see. And may in every house my Christ be your guest. Amen.